I'm so glad you're here. Do you like to draw? I know I do. I love to draw. And I'm so excited about today, our third episode of Teaming Up with NASA Artemis Moon Mission. Can you believe it? We're going back to the moon in 2024 with the first female and the next man. Ah, it's so exciting. Put that in your calendar, 2024. So for today's episode, we're going to be drawing the OC. SS. I have to look at my notes, make sure. OCSS. It's the Orion Crew Survival Systems, or as I call it, the super duper high tech awesome spacesuit. We're going to be drawing that. Let's take a look at the, this video about the spacesuit, and we'll be right back to draw. I know I want to wear a space suit. Wasn't that awesome? I want to go to the space station. I want to go to the moon. But I tell you what, you guys, you kids, you're in the age group that it's going to be your generation. You're going to be the explorers. You're going to be the ones that get to put these spacesuits on and train and go to the moon. So I'm, I'm excited for you. That's a possibility for you guys. It's a real possibility. Pretty cool, huh? Well, let's go ahead and switch cameras to my drawing camera here. And uh, I, we're going to do a warm-up drawing to get drawing. We're getting ready, getting our ideas and our imagination warmed up to draw this guy. Look at that. This is, this is my warm-up sketch. Pretty fun, huh? We're going to be drawing that. But first of all, I want to do a, a warm-up drawing. Now, I want to challenge and encourage. I'm going to fix my camera so you guys have a good shot. Okay. Now, I want to encourage you, you parents, please, 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 please draw with us, Okay. Parents, if you can if you can write your name, you can draw. If you can write your name, you can draw. So everybody just draw the circle. And parents, I guarantee you, take take the creative risk. We're gonna be talking about this later today. We're gonna be talking about how it's such an important part of the NASA development team for all these stages of Artemis, for them to 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 test things to the point where they know how much stress they can take. It's really cool. So it's the same philosophy. I want you to give yourself the creative license to, to fail, creative license to flop with your drawing. So I'm just going to draw a, a kind of a funky cartoon spacesuit. And uh, I have a special guest today who's going to draw an even cooler. Oh, I'll just whisper. It's going to be Ed Heck, but I'll introduce him in just a second. I'm so excited. Uh, he's on deck right now. I just, I can't believe I'm, I'm on the air with him. All right, so here's a four short and circle. Remember, there's 12 words of drawing. If you learn these 12 words, you can draw anything in 3D. These are the Renaissance words, and these are what you use to, they've been around for 500 years. And if you learn these words, you can draw. Now, this is a free uh, post, and I'll put this on the post with this uh, episode so you guys can get that free list of the 12 words. I didn't invent them. I've been using them for my 40 years of teaching. And they've been around for 500 years. So this is a four shortened circle. The idea of this is squish and distort. If you can squish and if you can distort a shape, you can make it look 3D. What 3D is, it's creating an optical illusion. You're conveying from what's in your imagination and what's, what's in your mind to um, on the paper so that people can see it translates your ideas a lot like the artist at NASA translate for the scientists and the tech technology uh, technicians and the mathematicians. They translate these 
ideas of the components of the space station so that the public can see and to get excited and experience the sense of wonder and excitement of the NASA Artemis moon mission. So the site, the artists are really the scribes of translators. So what I'm doing here, I'm just drawing a really funny little space suit. Isn't this cool? So here, look at, this is larger, see? This is size, that's one of these words, right? I was gonna write it, but I, I'd fill the whole page. I'm gonna make sure I post this, it's one of these words. 500 years old, these words, I didn't invent them, but I'm using them just like my teachers for, and their teachers and the, their teachers for many generations. All right, so now look, notice how I put the back foot higher. We're gonna do the same thing when we draw the, uh, our, this, the uh, <laughs> Orion Crew survival system the spacesuit. See how the back foot's gonna be higher up? It's gonna be really cool. All right, now I, I wanna take a moment right now during our warm up. I wanna introduce our, I'm gonna move my notes. Look at this, it's so funny, the live. On live, I have my notes right here. I wanna, oop, oh no, I have the wrong notes. Oh, no, this is hilarious. Well, I know who it is. We're going to introduce a good friend of mine. Uh, he was my co-star in 1985 on The Secret City. He played several characters. He played Zebtron. He played Cindy the Dragon. He played Meta Man. I'm so excited. All the way from Pennsylvania, live with us today, we have Joel Gorey. Hi, Joel. Hello there. How are you, Mark? I'm so excited to have you. I see that you have that, that image of uh, you, that Zebtron back behind you. Right. This was my character, one of my characters on The Secret City. And um, it's in black and white. It was done by a guest by the name of Al Groh uh, a long time ago. Uh, he was a guest in the show, and he did a, a cartoon of, of my character, which now hangs on my study wall. Do you remember, Joel, do you remember when you were Cindy the Dragon and you used to come over the top of the mural at the end of, the, of every show? Do you remember that? And you would just do your Cindy the Dragon Dragon gobbledygook, and I would look up and talk with you. Those were some of the most special moments during the show. Well, it was really funny because I would I would fill my mouth with paper, uh, wet paper, so I had this kind of weird, com weird sound like. Oh, and then I would have to respond. And I'm an artist. I'm not an actor, but I think I pulled it off sometimes. Hey, Joel, I have some good news for you. Uh, can you guys uh, come back to the camera here? Come back to my drawing camera. I want to show you guys something. Patricia's going to switch back to this camera. We're uh, good. Oh, you're there? Oh, there you are. Now, look at that. See, this is Joel, <laughs> right? Isn't that? Look at, were we ever that young, Joel? But right <laughs> down here, there's Meta Man, there's Joel, Mr. Handsome Guy, and there's Cindy. But on this image that we did the uh, Secret City mural, and I'm excited. I'm getting the mural back finally. Let's go ahead and really quick. I'm going to draw the arm. And I'm going to put that little hand. This is just a really fun kind of. Now, this back arm is going to be smaller. This is larger. And this one's smaller. It's further away. This is size again. Now, use your eraser. The reason we use a pencil is so that we can erase and we can mold and shape our drawings. Mold and shape. You want to draw lightly first, okay? Draw. There's a. Now, here's contour lines. There's contour lines. Now, we're just. I'm going to draw a little bit darker on this here and I hope that you kids and you parents are keeping up with me on this warm up this is really a great way to get your pencil getting ready to draw and listen to some amazing statistics and interesting facts and uh, scientific elements of the OCSS and to uh, introduce, introduce us uh, to the OCI. I have, I found my notes. I found my notes. I can say it right. We have Dustin. I'm so, I'm so proud of myself. I actually got organized this morning. We have Dustin Gomert and his family. He's the project manager of the Orion Crew Survival System, or as I call him, the top dog. Uh, Dustin and your family, say hi to the camera. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hey, Dustin, are you ready to have some fun talking about the uh, the super cool uh, uh, OCSS? Absolutely. We've been can, looking forward to it. Can your kids wave to us over their shoulders? Hey, guys, wave to the camera. Oh, wave, wave. Oh, I guess you're going to, they have their own, they have, that's right, they have their own separate cameras. Yep. Uh, we good. That's going to be a good exercise for Patricia, trying to switch the, uh, 
sw- switch the, <laughs> the show there. We have NASA artist Jack Moore and NASA educator Patricia Moore, my co-collaborators. Hey, Mark. <laughs> hey. There you go. Thank you guys so much. Can you believe it's episode three? I know. It's super exciting. I, I know. We're still, uh, still, is... still trying to keep up with you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This started with like 72-hour notice with our dear uh, leader idea, the idea inspiration from uh, Mr. Rad. Uh, what was what's Rad's full name? Sinyak. Rad Sinyak. Well, Rad, thanks a lot, Rad. Now, before I'm gonna, I am gonna finish my warm up, but I want to introduce uh, our featured celebrity guest artist, world famous Ed Heck. Ed Heck, wave. There's Hi. Ed Heck. Hey, thanks Ed. I'm so glad you're here. I'm happy to be here. Are you ready to draw the OCSS? Yep, I, I love following along with you all the time, so it's great. Ah, it's so cool. Hey Ed, look at the now behind him, Ed. Can you point to the uh, uh, the SL the uh, SLS, the Space Launch System, the other one, oh. rocket. There you, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> the rocket SLS. <laughs> I'm, I'm good at confusing everybody. Now Ed did that one from last week's show, and then the one right behind his head is the Orion Space Capsule, and we did that on episode one. And he put my name in it. I'm so cool. Yeah. That's so awesome. And Jack and Patricia. Yeah. Uh, I've never been to space. It's the closest I'll ever get to space. (laughs) Ed, we'll come right back to you. I'm going to just go about maybe another minute, you guys, on the warm-up. But look at I just have to show you this. Isn't that neat? Ed made me, and he made my son a cool one with a vacuum. Uh, But we have I have to get that printed up and show it. But look at that. All right. Let me finish this up. I'm so glad that we have everybody here. We have Dustin, and we have Ed, and we have Joe Gorey. So I'm just gonna draw. This is this is you guys, in your. Here here you are. Your your. This is your spacesuit, and your messy hair, and you're all excited, ready for the adventure. Notice how I put thickness on the right side, and this was just a quick scribble, you guys. Just a scribble to get your pencil warmed up, and there's our cool little spacesuit. And I'll just shade opposite the light. Shade. We're gonna use a lot of shading on this one. And darken it. See how I darken it? I focus it. And I'll be doing that when we draw our main drawing. So uh, we are ready to go now. All right. So are you ready to go on to the next part? Yeah, Patricia, take it away. All right. So um, I want to kind of remind everyone, if you've been watching or if you haven't been watching any of our programs, we're, um, all, we're all celebrating it and talking about NASA's Artemis program, which is our new human exploration uh, of, the, of the moon, so our new lunar exploration program. And so to kind of give you an idea of what the Artemis program is and all of the pieces and components, the rockets, the spacecrafts, the spacesuits that that take that are needed to make this mission successful, we're going to show you a really quick one minute animated a video that explains it done by our NASA artist John Streeter at Johnson Space Center. So you want to go to Mars. How do we send humans to deep space? In order for humans to explore the moon, Mars, and beyond, we need safe, flexible, and powerful systems that will make it all possible. We start with the world's largest spaceport. At Kennedy Space Center, we have all the buildings and tools needed to assemble and launch space vehicles and have the teams in place to recover the astronauts when they come home to Earth. Next up, we need a deep space rocket. This is NASA's space launch system. It will be the most powerful rocket NASA has ever built and it has the muscle to lift people and all of the equipment needed for missions to new worlds. The Space Launch System will blast off with the crew in the Orion spacecraft. The most advanced spacecraft ever built for human exploration, Orion provides the life support, power, communications, and other systems to safely transport astronauts on a variety of exploration missions, like to the moon. In lunar orbit, we will learn to live and work in a deep space environment, something we have never done before. In future missions, NASA's Gateway will be a place for astronauts to live, work, and prepare for missions deeper into the solar system. There you have it. NASA's Deep Space Exploration Systems, charting our new future in space. To find out more about deep space exploration, visit this NASA website. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, wasn't that a fantastic animated piece? 
Now, that was animated, as Patricia sh said, by NASA artist John Streeter. And he was our guest on episode one when we were drawing the Orion space capsule. Uh, amazing animation piece. And did you notice that Patricia Moore was one of the car the characters in the animation of the space capsule? Is that right, Patricia? Yeah, that's, that's me. That, he, he drew me. I was oh, one of the mission I control. <laughs> I was the mission control person in the window, the, um, the TV window inside the spacecraft. So I make little Easter egg of appearances in, in, in several of his uh, movies. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, well, let's get going on to our main drawing today. We're going to, now I got this, I downloaded this image right here from uh, NASA.gov, and I shrunk it so I can hold it in front of the camera. But look, we're going back to the moon. It's several pages. I encourage you guys to download this. This is what we're going to draw. We're going to draw that, that and I, oh, look at, of course, it's not in order for me. Look at this. Now I have to take time on camera live to put it in order. Well, we're going to start with the number one right here. There it is. Well, thank you, Jack. Yeah, so we're going to... Yeah, that, that, that's so what those... Uh, I was going to ah. say, just so everyone can uh, get access to this, what we'll do is we'll drop it in the links in YouTube. Uh, we'll also post it in the comments on uh, Facebook. So you, everyone can download this. This is a great little guide uh, to, to learn how to draw the, uh, the ox suit or the OCSS. Um, but, you know, today I think, you know, since we have a variety of different kinds of artists uh, on the line, you know, we, uh, you know, for folks at home, if they want, they can draw it this way. But I think uh, it'd be kind of neat if we all do our own sort of interpretations and positionings just so we could see how everyone does their own style. So, um, so I kind of, I'm, I'm curious, I'd like to go around the room just to see how, what everyone's thinking today, how they're going to portray the, uh, the ox. Well, I'm going to go ahead. I, I just love the 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 image that they sent so i'm gonna go i'm gonna just gonna do right along with the lesson oh look at that there's the kids well now that is uh who's that who, who's that hi guys hi guy wave <laughs> is that maddie yeah hi maddie and then there's uh you got dylan here dylan oh cool oh Good nice job. warm up boy that looks great I love it. Excellent job. All right, Mark, I'm going back to you. So, Mark, All you're right. doing the, the classic uh, right stuff walk. Uh, that always reminds me of when the astronauts are walking out the, uh, the, the preparation room at Kennedy Space Center, and they're, they're walking out to the Astrovan to go down to the pad for blast off. That, that's kind of that classic pose as they're waving at friends and family on their way to, to lift off. You know, speaking of lift off, might be a good plug just real quick um, to let everybody at home know be sure on Thursday uh, May 27th that was Wednesday oh, was it, oh it was the 20th May 27th whatever 27th is May 27th <laughs> uh, it, we're going to have the first launch uh, from U.S. soil uh, uh, to the International Space Station on the SpaceX uh, Dragon rocket so that's very exciting definitely want to check that check that out that'll be at uh, 333 p.m. Central Standard Time so uh, be sure to Check that out. It's going to be a very, very exciting event. So, Ed, uh, how about you? What do you? How are you uh, going to? I saw you started your sketch there a second ago. What are you thinking in terms yep. of depicting the uh, spacesuit today? Well, I'm going to take a little cue from Mark's original drawing and do something a little more simplified, since Mark's going to go for the the straightforward one. So, awesome. I'm going to have a little fun with mine. Very cool. All right. So while we're drawing, and I've got it on um, Mark's. Um, draw camera right now. Dustin, why don't you tell us a little bit about this suit? Because there's lots of spacesuits out there, and this one is unique and for the missions to um, to the moon and for the Orion spacecraft. So take it away. Oh, man. There's there's so much to say about it. It's I don't even know where to start. But uh, this will be the suit that the crew wears when they launch and when they land and when they do any deep space maneuvers in the Orion capsule that's going to be carrying us on the Artemis missions. So the, the crew will... Um, primarily wear these um, during active phases of flight, but they'll, uh, they'll at times, they'll get out of the suit and, and stow it. The suit is pretty cool. It's, it's main purpose, you can almost imagine it's a body-shaped balloon, hmm. and that balloon gives them their own environment that they can live in if something were to go wrong during the mission. So we're very much about safety, and in space is extremely dangerous, as we've learned from, from past um, accidents that have happened so we we want to make sure we take care of our crew in all circumstances awesome so why don't um why don't we talk a little bit about um how it is a survival suit so what, what does that mean exactly 
Yeah, so it, when they're in this suit, they're really on their own environment. That They're plugged into the vehicle and they're sitting in the capsule, but the capsule's filled with air, but if the capsule's air was lost, they have their own air inside. So they are completely set up to survive independent of the spacecraft. Now, that's not just for on space, though. So for launch, before launch, we have, we have um, features built in so they could get away from an uh, emergency on the pad. And even post landing, they have features built in so they could survive at sea with the with the water landings that we have if they had to leave the capsule. I think we've got a quick picture so I can show you, show everybody what we're talking about here. So here's a look at um, them getting out. Of, so why don't you kind of walk us through? I have those two pictures of of them getting out of the spacecraft in the water. Yeah, this is a pretty cool test that we ran a few years ago. This is a, an earlier rendition of the suit with some some mock-up hardware on it. But the thing we were working on was practicing. Uh, getting out of the capsule, we use the fancy word egress. Um, so we're so we're leaving the capsule to go to our life raft to seek safe haven from whatever imaginary contingency might have been going on. So we jump out. We have life preserver units. That's the the inflated looking floaties you see under the, the astronauts' arms there in the pictures. Huh. Um, so they they can inflate those. And when we look at the pictures later, you'll see the blue the blue kind of blobs, for lack of a better term, Oops. under their arms. And uh, that's what those life preservers are. Yeah, in the picture right there, you can see um, underneath the armpits of the of the subject there. That's actually those life preserver units built into the suit. Cool. So, do they automatically um, inflate, or do they have to pull a cord, or how's that work? You know, in shuttle, they did automatically inflate, and in shuttle, we had them automatically inflate because if you were to get out to the water, you had to jump from a active vehicle and and land via parachute, and so you wanted that. In this case, we actually don't want them to inflate because a wave could wash into the capsule side and inflate and entrap you. So these are manually activated so that when they when they get to the capsule door, they pull some cords kind of right under their armpits. They pull them and uh, inflate them as they enter the water. Cool. So um, what all do they have in their suit to help them um, survive if they're if they're stranded a bit before NASA can get to them and rescue them? So uh, post landing, the, the suit the suit um, actually only has a bare minimum of supplies on it itself. We actually have we have the flotation device. The suit itself acts as a dry suit, which is very important. If you land in the North Atlantic, for example, where the water is around 40 degrees. Um, hey, babe. Oh, we got a picture here. OK, let me. Let awesome. Me, let me get to her. Oh, there we go. Very good. Go. Great right. job. Awesome. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Good job, Madison. Yeah, so the suit isolates you from that cold water to keep you safe. I mean, that's first and foremost, your environment, keeping you safe from the environment, which a lot of the environments we land in are pretty rough environments. And so uh, we got the flotation. We got the isolation from the water. We have signaling devices built in. As soon as they pop that uh, life preserver unit to float, it gives us access. We're actually building the next generation of GPS systems. So we can locate the crew within just a couple of meters Wow. within seconds we hmm. know anywhere they are on the globe just instantly and we can send our rescue forces right to that spot which is i mean honestly we have gps it's today and um you we all think of it as hey it's this precise positioning it it is but it's actually quite limited and when you get into the far regions of the globe um just how much the satellites can relay your location so We've actually upgraded that. Um, the guys on our team have worked so hard to make this reality for, for crew survival. Um, the crew also has oxygen bottles built onto their legs. If there was a hazard in the capsule, like like bad gases or something leaking out of the capsule, they, they can open those bottles and get air to have while they get away from the capsule. They can also use it on orbit if, um, if there is a failure of the... Uh, the breathing system on orbit it's since it's oxygen they can keep breathing it, it there as well um, if you look at the suit you see uh the v on the chest that comes down to a little uh black knob looking thing well that underneath that v it's not just cosmetic underneath that v is a harness sewn into the cover of the suit and so that harness actually goes down to the legs uh wraps around the legs you can see at the top of the thighs some blue straps going across the the thighs there and so it's it's almost like a, a fall arresting harness built into the suit. And so you can actually, what you don't see is just to the left and right of the, the NASA meatball, the logo, are handles. And uh, people can use that to rescue the crew, to grab them and lift them. Or if uh, maybe a ship of opportunity came by, they could latch onto the crane and be hoisted out of the water. Cool. So um, so is how does the suit built? Is it a one size fits all? Or do you make different sizes for different size astronauts? 
Oh man, I wish it was one size fits all that makes your job. <laughs> yeah. Too bad humans aren't all yeah. the same shape, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this whole humans in space thing would be so easy if it wasn't for the human part. <laughs> um, yeah, so so humans, uh, you never look at a person again the same way after you design a spacesuit. You you no longer care that a person is six foot tall. You start caring about the length of their arm or the length of their shin or the length of their their back as they sit down or their thighs. And you look at them in segments and because we're so different all of us these suits are all custom built for our crew um because we because part of what we do in this suit is going to be long duration survival up to six days the suit has to fit just perfectly and so we we custom build them for each crew member yeah that's kind of interesting because uh, as we started our drawings everybody was was blocking out the forms like you, you kind of start with a with a torso and then ovals for the legs and you're kind of you're, you're you're creating the volume uh, mm -hmm. that eventually will be outlined as as your subject, and it sounds like there's a little bit of that when you're designing the spacesuit. You know, you're you're taking all these measurements off of the person that's going to be wearing it because you have to understand how they're going to fit in that suit, and they don't get bunched up in certain locations. So, uh, but I have a question now. I understand you have uh, a, a, an art background, and are a pretty accomplished <laughs> artist, uh, Doug. Uh, sorry, oh. Dustin. Sorry. Um, so when we're designing the suits is there any uh, aesthetic influence uh, as you're kind of designing it do you cut something to uh to meet a, an appeasing form factor or is it all really kind of strictly uh driven by requirements and and uh, how the suit has to function or is it a combination well i honestly when we start we do look at function first safety is the utmost but it's got to look cool i mean we're going to space so, I mean. can it, speaking of cool yeah, can i show yeah, them your, it, your drawing dustin can it, i show them it, yeah that'd be that'd be fine okay that'd be fine that'd be fine <laughs> so tell yeah, so us a little bit about you you're a pretty great artist so why don't you tell us a little uh -huh. bit about your background and and and, and what inspired you <laughs> i grew up kind of a nerd reading comic books so you can kind of see the artistic yeah, uh, <laughs> influence there so uh yeah um yeah so uh that that that, that picture is artemis is a is a hunter and artemis is the goddess of the moon and so it's kind of the, the sun rising over the moon given the shape of a bow which is what she hunted with and um and then the imagery of like the the orion capsule um as the arrow uh, flying off so it, it's just kind of a, a inspirational non-realistic but i thought it, it was fun to draw yeah um i get really bored in some of our very very long meetings and so um, i always carry a pad of paper with me people are like you must be taking a lot of notes i'm like no nah, check out this picture <laughs> so, um, so uh yeah uh awesome. we uh we we but but you know even even in the form part of the suit it's so hard with people to design as we do a mechanical system where you can just draw it up in CAD and you have length, width, and height. People are so different. And then even when you do get a dimension, you have to account for people are squishy things. Mm. They're, not, they're not this hard, rigid thing you can put a bolt or a screw into. And so when we go start laying out parts of the suit, you realize, oh, that doesn't fit on that size person or this, that, or the other. Even look at the picture of the, of the, uh, that you have on the screen right now, those, those connectors on the belly, the red and the blue, we spent we spent inordinate amount of time figuring out how to put those those gas connectors on the suit because hmm. as somebody gets really small you start running out of room really really fast on that body to put these these shapes that don't change size and so we found that you know this abdominal area uh it stays open pretty much whether you're big little or small and and so then you take the space suit but our challenge is unlike the mu where you're you're out in space and you're standing we have to stand we have to sit, we have to run, we have to walk, and then we have to be pressurized. And so keep in mind, this suit has to sit in the seat in Orion with almost like a harness, almost like a racing seat belt strapped over you. So we had to really start positioning everything very discreetly to make it all fit in a nice tidy package. One of the weird things you'll see on the legs is you'll see things pointed in weird directions like the, the, the comm cable you see on the, on the person's left leg standing there, the communication um, connector. Um, that's what that black cord is. It looks like it points down at the ground and you'd say, why, why would you do that? But when, when you're laying on your back and your feet are up in the air, it points directly to the interface box that is mounted right there where you can see it. So it really is function uh, driven, but we also really started to, to try to make it a little bit cool as well. On yeah, top. I think but it we got the really blue. cool. <laughs> Austin, I have a question, a little bit of an artistic question for you regarding the suit. Aesthetically, yeah. I love the bright orange color and it looks great with the 
dark blue straps. But typically, unlike other missions, you also see like the suit that they wear outside the ship is typically white, and then usually you see the um, the suits that they wear inside are always bright orange. Is there a reason other than aesthetically for the color? Absolutely. There's really, really very good reasons for it. So this suit, given that we land in the water, uh, really the, the orange color is to identify the crew if we were to have to leave the capsule. It's primarily a crew survival mechanism. It's it's such an intangible thing that, that really is just built into the suit as part of its function. You can say it's almost decorative. And people call it the pumpkin suit from time to time because of its orange color, but it really is um, operations driven for crew recovery. The white suits you see out in space are very much um, very purposely done that because as you face the sun, which is going to be about 350 degrees, just like touching a white car versus a black car out in a hot parking lot in the summer day, the white car is going to get less hot than the black one. So we picked the white color so that it absorbs less of that solar radiation. Likewise, facing the dark, cold of deep space, we give off less heat on that side of our body, too. So the white really does a lot of benefits thermally for us. Hmm. I have a question, Dustin. I, 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 there's so much detail. It's, it's just fascinating. How long did it take to design this, this suit? Oh my, uh, it's, it's taken us a while. And I got to give credit to all the, all the w people and generations who came before us. We didn't even start with a blank slate. We had such a phenomenal uh, um, starting point to go from with what we had from the shuttle. But what we started doing is, is tinkering and taking it apart piece by piece and rebuilding it. So this suit, if you look at it, really has a shuttle heritage, as you can see, because it's orange. Those connectors on the belly are straight off Apollo suits um, from, you know, from the late 60s and, and 70s when they flew. Uh, we found parts just laying around in drawers. They may have been to the moon. We have no idea. But we started just finding old parts and tinkering and cobbling things together over time. And, and then we would mature them and build new parts, but it really took us a good 10 years to come up with a, what we call a final design. And, and as you guys know, like with your art projects, you're never quite satisfied that it's finished. And, and we have that trouble too, where we have to draw the line in the sand and just say, pencils down, we're done. Um, but we're, we're about at that point right now where we're ready to start building them and qualifying them. Hey, Dustin, um, what are these pieces? If you look, switch to this camera right here, if you would, Patricia. It's there. Um, yeah, what what are these uh, canisters here? And tell tell me tell me. I know you mentioned these are the flotation devices, right? That's right. What about these on the leg? So those bottles on your legs are the oxygen bottles that the crew wears that I mentioned earlier. And so when you're when you're, they look like you're kind of in a weird spot, and you ask why would you wear them on your legs? And honestly, it's not our favorite spot. But I often use the fra uh, term we use the least worst uh, option. <laughs> um, when you're trying to make everything that's a compromise. And so these bottles, there is nowhere left on the body when you sit in the seat of Orion to position them. But the good thing is, as your legs are up in the air and your knees are right there, that puts the switch to activate them right there so you can really quickly get to them to turn them on. Oh, that's cool. Tell me, tell me more about the helmet and the, the gear. The uh, the helmet uh, is, is one of the cool things about this helmet versus any helmet we built in the past is we're actually making two sizes of it. Um, it's been prohibitively expensive and difficult in the past to build multiple sizes because historically this is such limited run stuff. We've done it by hand, mm. but computer aided drawing has gotten to the point now where we can build one and scale it much easier. And so we're now building the helmet to fit the smaller females that we can actually truly accommodate almost everyone who wants to go to space now big or small um and uh the helmet is uh you know you can don it you can take it off the suit manually um you can open the visor to get a breath of fresh air it's got a sunscreen so it can uh, shade you in case you're um exposed to some radiation environments it does does quite a bit for you cool. that's so cool hey let's take a look at ed hex drawing I've been I've been showing previews, so they they just saw it a few seconds ago. But I love I love the you don't have a human in your um, in your spacesuit, do you, Ed? No, I, I thought we'd uh, <laughs> stand the, the crew a little bit. So Ed, I, I love your style. Um, tell us a little bit about how how you came to this because it's so it it's very easy to connect to. It's it's simple it's simple, but it's it just playful. carries so much. Yeah. yeah, it's playful. How did how did you sort of start? 
working in this style and this feel? Well, a uh, um, little bit of a journey there. Um, I started um, as a, a scientific illustrator. I worked for the American Museum of Natural History in New York City for about 18 years. And growing up, I was always interested in very realistic artwork. And then at some point, I really loved the way small children drew and how a child would draw, you know, uninhibited about what the end result will be or what anyone else would think. And I was inspired by that. And I tried to make childlike drawings myself. And that's kind of where this took off from. And that's where it was born. Awesome. Wow. Yeah, I love that. It's so great. It, and and uh, they, all, they all feel like they're kind of in the same universe, right? The same form factor. They're all in family. Just looking at your ox suit there and then uh, looking at the uh, SLS and the Orion that you have yeah. behind you, they're, they're all in that same style, which is so cool. What a, what a great collection. Thanks. I love this story, how you started as the scientific illustrator for the Natural History Museum. I love the Natural History Museum in New York City. I love it. And you were one of the illustrators making all those information charts and diagrams. That's just awesome. And a lot of the research that the scientists do and publish, that's what we do. And when you were a, you know, a high school student, did you have any idea that you would end up with all the different jobs that you've had? No, actually, like I said, I, growing up, I was always very interested in only realistic um, drawing. So um, I never knew. And I, I didn't even know um, up until after I graduated. I just, um, when I went to college, I majored in illustration. And when I got out, I started uh, illustrating children's books. But um, I didn't know what a scientific illustrator was until I became one. I just saw an ad um, advertising from the museum, looking for someone that can draw realistically and had a knowledge of photography. And I applied and um, was kind of trained on the job there. And then the pop art that I do now, too, um, I would have never imagined that I would be doing this also. I just kind of, you know, followed that line. And uh, like I said, I was inspired by children's drawings. And then I went back to school and took a silk screening class and started doing these drawings and silk screening. And the kind of that's where that led to. So I, I had no idea where I would end up. And I, I still don't know. Where we, have a, <laughs> we have a small well, video of some of your works. Do you mind if we take a look at them? Sure. Yeah, and you can talk us through them um, if you want yeah. as we go through it. Well, that's just my little logo of the world. I'm trying to take over the world little by little. I love that. I love that. And that's uh, me with one of my paintings of a... I, I do a lot of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I painted a stage on Broadway. Oh, that's that was cool. Play. Fun fun getting uh, being able to walk inside of my drawings. Yeah. The little uh, cityscape. Some of my uh, children's books. Some picture books and board books. Oh, that's neat. Okay. And this is um, a little uh, thing for uh, that we have going right now uh, with the current situation. Um, face mask with my artwork on that we're offering for people. That's great. Very cool. Well, there's kind of a. I, I don't want to bury the lead on that project because there's there's kind of a neat uh, connection there that uh, for every one that's purchased, is it, am I getting it right that one is uh, donated to? Uh, yeah, we're first responders. We're, um, Donating to over 30 hospitals in New York, New Jersey, and Boston right now. And then going forward, every mask purchased by the public will also provide another mask for a frontline worker or a healthcare worker. That's amazing. Love that, Ed. I love that. That's wonderful. And I thought, you know, we have to wear masks, so we might as well make it fun. That's right. right. I, <laughs> Did you have some masks? Can you show us some masks that you, you um, have? Do you have some handy? And I'm still That's waiting it. for my care package of masks for Mario and I, buddy. Uh, here's a, here's a oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, some New York City ones. Love it. And actually, actually, Mark, here, I'm going to send you one of these. we got a pencil power one here. All right. Oh, Over wow. Here. And we have them in adult and kid size. That's great. So um, we were talking earlier about the, the suit, and, and you mentioned testing, Dustin. So uh, we, we do a lot of testing at NASA, obviously. We want to test for failure to make sure that we know the limits of our equipment or limits of our spacesuit so we can keep our, our, um, our, our astronauts safe. And we want to kind of make that testing and practicing connection to art because it, it goes both ways. So Jack, yeah. why don't you? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, um, you know, and, 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 uh, it's great that we have Joel here because uh, I think there's some, some interesting crossover between uh, Joel's career as a professional actor uh, and then also, you know, uh, the suit testing because 
you know, as we uh, get ready for a show, be it a TV production, I think we actually have some footage from uh, Secret City here. So we have uh, Joel portraying Zebtron. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of Look practice. Look at that. Was, were, were we ever that young, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> But there's a lot of practice that goes in beforehand, right? There's a lot of rehearsals. There's a lot of um, just doing it over and over and over until you get it right, which is very similar to like for a spacewalk, for instance. The astronauts will uh, practice underwater in the neutral buoyancy laboratory, a large swimming pool here in Houston, Texas. Uh, and they strap on their spacesuits and they, they essentially do an EVA and they practice those maneuvers over and over again. So it's almost like muscle memory. Um, Joel, when you guys prepared for your episodes on Secret City, did you did you often do uh, extensive rehearsals? Did uh, can you tell talk to us a little bit about that process? How did those well, shows come together? Yes, well, you know the, that contraption, which is one of my favorite shows, you know, I, I put together the night before, and and very much like what Dustin said when they were looking for different parts, uh, sections of the of the suit, they they would open a drawer and find something, and they said, "Oh, this will work," you know. Um, kind of like found art. Uh, so I, Dustin, Dustin and, and the designers have to do much more uh, detailed and definite things because it's, it's truly survival. But when I was doing that, um, that contraption, it worked very, very well, you know, uh, in rehearsal. But during the live shooting, um, I, I dropped the ball into this little cylinder and it, it was supposed to go around and finally come out and doing the TV show. It, it didn't come out. Oh, it was so funny. It was such a great on air blooper that oh. we had to keep in. And then, and then I could hear all of the, uh, the, the director and the producer and the technicians, you know, in the booth behind a glass wall, just howling over <laughs> it didn't work. Um, but you're right. Very much like what astronauts do. The actors have to, have to repeat in rehearsal uh, the staging or the blocking, as we call it. So it's 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 just secondhand knowledge, and uh, you think of all the different possibilities in case something should go wrong in performance, or or be ready to figure out how to solve the problem. Uh, you know, if, if if I was in space and something went wrong, you have to improvise, uh, right? Oh, you improvise, yeah, but very, very intelligent improvisation. Yeah. Right? So, so Dustin, can you give us an example of, of of kind of the the rehearsals that the astronauts do in their suits and kind of what that what you do to train and prepare them? Oh, you're muted. There we go. <laughs> yeah, every crew that goes into space is going to spend at least a year uh, training for that mission. And we're going to do over the course of that year several dozen simulations where we get them suited every time we strap them in we get them um, very familiar with the hardware and each individual process they're going to do like you mentioned for spacewalks we call them evas extravehicular activity because we we're all about the acronym <laughs> um, they they'll spend eight to ten hours in the pool for every hour they spend in space and so the training is just non-stop that these these uh ladies and gentlemen go through over the course of that year but when they get there it's almost second nature to them now is there any uh I improvisation on on the nasa side sometimes during meetings or during uh, <laughs> uh missions I, you know i i'm i'm willing you know they they say uh what they say about best laid plans um and nothing survives no no plan survives first contact so yeah there's going to be a lot of <laughs> improvisation that goes on as long as we know the basics of what has to be done um you know they're in their home when they're up there that's their home and so we're going to tell them here's your job but they have to live um, around that scenario that they're in. And, and that's why they have a commander that works and trains with his or her crew um, to become a functioning unit a, as a team. Hmm. Very cool. Uh, that's so when I look at that, that, that suit, I, you know, and, and coming from a theater background, um, I, I was thinking if I, if I had to do this in a play, put that costume, that suit on, I would probably have a dresser. Yeah. Uh, so two questions. Like, you know, how difficult is, is it to put that that space suit on? Mm. Uh, it, it well, if you haven't done it before, it can be pretty daunting. We've done it so much now that um, I, I can get into it in probably five minutes or so. 
um, it, it really is just a, imagine a onesie that you'd put your your small kid into. Um, it's it's a, a really really expensive onesie. It unzips from crotch to shoulder. You just pull it on with your legs like a pair of pants and slide your shoulders in and pop your head through and stand up. Um, and really, once you get that part on, you're you're pretty well dressed. Um, there's a lot of undergarments that go on below it, and and then of course your helmet, gloves, but boots, but um, it, it's not too difficult. If we were to go into the full deep space survival mode, there's a lot of um, uh, waste management uh, features that have to be done first that, that make it take a little bit longer. Yeah, huh. is it, so is this one a lot easier to put on than the EVA suit, the big um, white suit that we wear on space station? Uh, well, <laughs> it depends if they're listening or not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they, they're, they're different functions. Okay. okay. So, so you got to keep in mind, every suit's built for its own unique purpose. This one, this one is designed to be rapidly donned. So if, mm. if something was to happen in the vehicle while we're on orbit, this, because this suit becomes your own personal spacecraft until you get home. So if something's going afoul, you have to be able to get in it really fast. And so we, we prescribe 15 minutes allocation for each crew member to get fully suited. Um, the EVA, they're going to take a lot longer. They're going out in deep space, which is one of the most hazardous environments you could possibly imagine. And they're doing that on purpose. So they're going to take longer to get suited up and, and do a lot of double checks um, as, as they get in that suit. What is the, um, what's the longest period of time uh, we would plan to, that a crew member would be in the suit? Oh, you don't want to know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So if something was to go wrong on the on the far side of the moon or in a in a transit back from Mars, say in the future, oh, we've wow. designed the suit so you could actually survive in it up to six days. Wow. You can imagine wow. the context of you, you're imagine that your home is an inch bigger than your body, yeah. and you're living in that for six days, oh, <laughs> and um, so it's it's pretty tough. We have to find ways to uh, feed them, get them uh, liquids and food, and we have to find ways to deal with the waste that they produce from that food. So it, it's a pretty tough challenge to, to confine you like that. Yeah, but it's but it makes, I mean, it's a great thing. The astronauts know that they're they're safe and they've got everything they need in that suit and uh, they don't have to, they don't have to worry. I would imagine they're pretty involved in the process too, huh? Do you guys work closely with, with the astronauts as you're developing different features? We do. We do. We spend a lot of time working with the crew. Um, we've got a very open door policy between us and the crew office, and um, we bring them in. We try them on the suit. We get their feedback, especially the flown crew members who've been through it, who've done spacewalks. And what is, you know, what's great is ones we we pulled in ones from who who've been in the shuttle suit, the Sokol that the, that they wear in the Russian Soyuz. Um, we've we've had them in the uh, the Orlan, which is the the Russian EVA suit, and we've had them in our EVA suit, uh, the EMU. And so we get this vast array of experience and we, we start learning what can we do better in this area or that area. And uh, we take the crew's feedback and, 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 and work it in. Awesome. So um, are your kids, do they want to show, do they, are they still around? Do they want to show their drawings? We give them a chance to show their work. I think so. Go get Madison so she can show her drawing, Dylan. Okay. Yeah. Give us a good couple minutes. Okay. She, uh, we, we have short attention spans. That's all right. Here, so we're uh, working on it. That's all right. <laughs> we'll, we'll go around. The joy alive. That's yeah, the joy I should have given you more sure. warning. Let me go around. I've got yeah. it on Marks right now. And, hey. uh, and then I'm going to pass it on. Oh, another yeah, question go. for Dustin. Yeah. So you were just saying that it, it can house the um, support them for six days. Does the, each suit have their own power source? Because I was assumed that you wouldn't be have access to an external power source if that's the problem. Yeah, you know the weird thing is there the suit doesn't even need power. So it's 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 really actually there is no electrical power going to the suit. There is gas flow going to the suit that keeps it pressurized and so there's a gas inlet and a gas exhaust and that's really the core survival of the suit. It it all plugs into a big giant fan that's inside of the Orion capsule and it blows through each one of the suits. So the suit really is just part of the uh the suit loop. We joke that it's a it's an aneurysm in the in the suit plumbing <laughs> is what it comes out to. Hey, I got a question for Ed. You you said something that really sparked my imagination when you said that you you essentially got to walk around inside of one of your drawings uh for a Broadway play. Can you can you talk a little bit about that that experience? That just sounds really cool. Um it was a it was a Broadway theater that was opening up which actually um was a little unusual than most theaters is that they had four theaters in one where they would have 
be able to have four different shows going on at one time. Um, so for their opening, for the press release and everything, they wanted to have something going on in each one of the stages. So they asked me if I would be able to come in and paint the stage, which was supposed to be just kind of um, temporary, but they ended up keeping it and actually um, they uh, used it for uh, when they were rehearsing for um, one of the Beach Boy plays. So it, it got a lot of use out of that, uh, but it was great. I, I had no idea how I was going to do it when I agreed to do it. But it was, <laughs> luckily, they had a camera above me so I could see on a big screen what I was doing um, and just draw it out. But it was great. I was able to walk inside of my drawing because it was so large. Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. That's cool. You know, and, and you know, there's kind of an, an interesting theater connection there too. You know, one of the things that that I always love to talk about is the art, the role that art plays at NASA. And uh, you know, my, my my background is in art, and it's been very helpful in my job. And we do a lot of uh, uh, designs for exhibits and experiences, and even uh, PAO uh, productions. In fact, uh, we have a video here to show a little bit of the process. Uh, when our astronauts graduated this year, they finished their training, a two-year intensive training period, and we wanted to do a, uh, a graduation ceremony. So we went to the whiteboard, we started throwing down some ideas, and we hit on this notion of putting the moon on the stage. Uh, so after we did our drawings, we moved into a 3D model uh, to kind of block things out. Um, and then we even did a rehearsal. Uh, in fact, here's Patricia standing in for Patricia! an astronaut. <laughs> She's standing in for an astronaut here. So Tricia has technically uh, been in an astronaut graduation, which I think qualifies her for space. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. So we're going to send her over to you, Dustin, to get suited <laughs> up. Uh, but here's the uh, the final piece. Um, uh, it was an awesome production, and then Moon was such a, a, a great focal point uh, and, a, and a good reference because this is the generation of astronauts that will likely be wearing the OCSS uh, and, and flying on Orion, uh, and uh, it'll be the first woman and the next man uh, to walk on the surface of the moon in, in 2024, which is so exciting as we're getting all of our hardware ramped up and ready to fly. Yeah, it's super exciting. And, and one of the things that we've mentioned on each of our um, each of our shows, this is our third one, is that, that NASA uses art. And, and there's this great connection um, between starting with an idea and, and, and drawing out your sketch. I'm sure Just, Dustin and his teams did that. They draw out a sketch of what they think the suit should look like, the parts that they need, and then it gets more technical. They put it in you know, to a computer and, they, and, and then they start adding other additional components to it. But it all starts with a sketch. And so having that steam, you wanna talk about steam, um, Mark? You love, you, this is your favorite bit. <laughs> um, okay. I, I, I had I had it mute because can we just I got to I got to show it's squirrel. Okay, come here. I got to show you this. I got to show you this, Fad. Come here. Come here. I got to put 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 Mario on. Oh, this Mario. is my son. Whoa. There's my son. The graduate. Come, on, come up closer. There he is. And and he's got his tassel back there. Turn, turn your head a little bit sideways. There's his tassel. Awesome. There's Mario, congratulations, away. man. That's awesome. I present to you my son, Mario Kistler. He's a graduation class of 2020. Thanks, Mario. Give me a fist bump. That's so cool. And all, I'm going to give everybody who's awesome. graduated. Congratulations. This, here, yeah. I'm going to give everybody, you guys, fist bump to all you graduates out there. Fist Boom. bump to the graduates. Now, get online and apply to be a NASA artist today. They have applications. Now, we well, have to repeat your question because yeah, so, I, so, so, no, no, no. I was leading into I was leading into you, your your most passionate moments in the show is talking about the importance of steam and and the arts in addition to the science and technology and how art is in, oh, oh yeah, of course yeah. of course well let me just pull up my last <laughs> drawing from last there week shall go. we yeah I got it up because for you. I, I I really really had a good time on that last episode um, I, I'm I'm have loving this and I Dustin. Your, your information is incredible, and your kids are doing such a wonderful job with their drawings. I, I've been trying not to step on everybody with my audio, but man, oh man, good job, kids. Do we want to cut? They wave. haven't got a chance to yeah. show them yet. Why don't we okay. do that real quick? Well, here's, here's They're the, ready. Uh, you guys ready to go show? Put on your headsets so you can talk. Okay, so let, I'll tell you about the steam. Right now, across the, the country, well, around the, across the world, the curriculum goals of schools is steam, science, uh, STEM, science, mm. technology, engineering and math, which are really good, important, noble pursuits for humankind. But I think that the most important, of course, I'm an artist, but the most important is the A we have to stick in the middle is art. 
you have to be able to take the science, technology, engineering, and math and have to apply it to the real world, to, to what you're working on today to solve problems. And art helps transform minds into creative problem solving. So that's the goal. So full steam ahead, you guys at Artemis. Yeah, all right. You know, and if I could chime in on that, you know, not only is art helpful, uh, you know, and, and really at the end of the day, uh, my, my job would boil down to more of a, a project manager and, and probably 10% designing. So I use art in my job, but I also find that art is, is very, it's an enrichment, you know. So even if you are an astrophysicist, you know, being able to kind of put your head down and lose yourself in your own creation, uh, it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to relax and Almost, unwind. Almost, guys. Um, Almost. So it's a great, you know, it's just a great thing to have for personal enrichment. So let's see those pictures. All right, Madison, you want to hold it up? I've got you up. Everybody's looking at you. So oh, hold up your Madison! Right, hold Show it up your picture, for us. babe. Can you hold it up? Good oh, job. Wow, look at that. Oh. The stars and floating in space. That's so cool. I love it. Great, baby. All right, good job. All right, Dylan, I'm That's coming to you. That's wonderful, Madison. Coming to you, Dylan. Hold it up. Dylan, look at that enthusiasm. You are some, you are amazing, passionate oh, artist. Oh, awesome. Oh, wow. Great job. Shut on the launch stand there. That's cool. That's, is that the mobile launch platform? Are we going to draw that one next week? <laughs> That's what's on deck next week. Hey, hey, Dylan, Dylan, do you have one of those? Uh, show me one of the drawings that you did yesterday. You had a whole bunch of them that were. Why don't you yeah. pull that off the wall, bud? Pull the moon one off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to show. He's like a dad. Of course, I throw a wrench in the whole thing. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, let me see this. This is so cool. Look at that! Oh, great! Was that great. was that worth it or what? That's all right. an awesome job. Well, thank you guys for showing. That. Sorry about that, Dustin. I just I love those. Look at all the drawings on the wall back behind there, guys. You guys, you kids, <laughs> uh, Madison and Dylan, you're doing great. <laughs> all right. Well, um, we've got a few more minutes before um, before the show ends. So let's. Um, oh, there. I was getting ready to ask. There's Dustin. Right. Let's hold it up a little bit slower so we can. Yeah, hold okay. it a little bit longer. There you go. Yeah. Our our uh, our suit manufacturer is going to be like, damn it, he's drawing again. We're going to have to change the suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Awesome. All right, and I'm going to come to you, Ed, okay? You're next. Okay. All right. Oh, I love it. I love it, Ed. Yeah, I'm already making some modifications there, Justin. <laughs> you awesome, have to add awesome. The That's what we need. Top of yours. <laughs> you know, y'all y'all talked about art and and science blending together, and you know the thing that you start to learn really fast the longer you spend doing it is engineering and science aren't as black and white as you would think they are. There's a lot of of middle ground that's very gray, and the art helps with that. And so, I mean, I would throw out to all the kids out there who who really want to study the math and the science. And I, I think that's great as an engineer myself, but also the softer side of the skill has to be taken into account. Cause if you don't, you'll run into roadblocks. You can't get past. So hmm. I think this is great to, to pass along to kids. So creative thinking helps kids and helps students and helps everyone navigate those roadblocks in life. Yeah. Love that. Yep. Yeah. That's a great point. And uh, I'm going to head to Jack. Jack's making his, uh, Oh, let me see, oh Jack. There we go. Well, do a little after here. Jack, that's so cool. Mission complete. High fiving. Welcome home. <laughs> Jack, this is so cool. <laughs> All I, right, you know so, what? Oh. I, I, I wish we we had that picture of. Uh, oh, there's Mario. Here, Mario brought up the kitty cat. He's part. Part. He's that's uh, Gordon. Aww. Thank you, Marty, Mario. Hey, uh, thanks, Mario. Hey, Jack, do you have? Um, a picture of when you first started drawing with, with he was drawing with joel and me on the secret city when you were like eight years old do you have that picture by oh should... you know I, I i i don't have it handy here but yeah well, we'll show was, it next week that was we'll, so we'll... uh that you know that was a my my young brain was uh hi kids look there's their doggy <laughs> oh who's that that's that's cooper he's our he's our uh cocker spaniel hey awesome. cooper awesome he likes to swim oh yeah, our dogs, space. our dogs don't like to swim. Yeah. <laughs> they stay away from the water. Awesome. Yeah, 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 but when I grew up watching Secret City, it was uh, it was so so neat to to create these worlds and and just really learn the fundamentals. And I feel I feel like I still carry that over today as I'm trying to communicate my ideas to my teammates. Sometimes it's hard to describe. So if I could just jump up on the whiteboard and start scribbling things down, uh, it becomes a really effective way of communicating. So. Um, 
I, I always look fondly on those days, and, and I do have a photo to prove that Mark invented the selfie. We'll take a look at that next ah, week. <laughs> I love that. All right, hey, so uh, what are we drawing next week, Jack? All right, we are drawing the mobile launch platform, which is what will launch the space launch system and the Orion spacecraft to the moon. And so it, all of our human um, launches with our astronauts are always launched at Kennedy Space Center. Um, and we've, like Jack said, we've got our astronauts launching on the 27th of May on SpaceX. So that's super exciting. So, um, so next week we'll, we'll draw the mobile launch platform. And why don't you tell us about uh, next week's guest, Mark? Before our we next off. week guest, we have a really cool artist, uh, former Simpsons animator. I don't know if you ever watched The Simpsons, uh, which I love it. He did a lot of the scenes when. What's the little daughter's name? She, uh, what was her name? Do you guys Maggie remember? Or Maggie. Lisa? The Maggie. Maggie. The, no, no, that was the the, the daughter's name. The the, the, the S -S Susie or South. Anyhow, the little girl <laughs> was playing the saxophone. He did a lot of those scenes. Uh, Lisa. He's all, he, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, he was Lisa. <laughs> He's gonna. I'll have to get that right for the introduction for next week. And he, uh, former Disney animator for Disney Interactive. He did uh, the. Uh, I think he worked on the the Tarzan. He'll have to. You'll have to confirm this, but he worked in a lot of just a lot of the Disney Interactive. He's a professor now at the University of Mo, uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, and MATC. So uh, he's just he's an awesome, not only animator but a puppeteer and a claymation guy. He's done a lot of uh, of our summer art camps over the years. So he's going to come on with us. I'm very excited. Cool. All right. Well, we're here at the top of the hour, so um, I'm going to go to Brady Bunch view. So I have a, just a, one more thing I want to mention. Oh, um, so I do want to put out a couple of thank yous. Mark, uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for you know, sharing, uh, your, sharing our, our activities with your audience. And, and this is so cool to collaborate and, and get to do this with you guys. And, and Joel, uh, appreciate you coming in and, and sharing in a conversation, giving us your unique, your unique insight from the days of Secret City and your current experience as an actor. Ed. What a joy, man. This has been so much fun to see all, all these activities interpreted through your lens and, and it, what a colorful lens it is. So thank you for, for doing this. Dustin, uh, man, you're the man with the answers. That was a lot of fun. We appreciate you being on board and giving us some cool insight, uh, no matter how gross it was uh, into the soup. But this is a really oh, a t a technical marvel. I, I had a blast. Thanks for yeah, having thank, me. Thank you so no much, problem. Dustin. And, and Ed and uh, Joel, just awesome. And I, I want to add one more thank you, uh, not on screen today, but to uh, Matt Kelly, who uh, provided us from Studio Space today. Um, he's, he is an artist in his own right. I actually have a couple of his images here. It's a photograph of downtown Houston. You can find his work at Future Photography. So uh, thank you, Matt, for letting us come and crash your studio this morning. Oh, and so parting words, be sure if you are drawing along with us, to post your art. We want to see it. Post it on Draw Artemis. Or hashtag, hashtag Draw, draw Artemis. Artemis. So the best yeah. way to do it is either on Instagram. That's where most of the art is. And if you don't have an Instagram, you can post on, on Twitter or Facebook. But now you may be one of the, the special chosen that gets to have your art retweeted or repost by NASA. So. And also, if I can interject real sure. quick, that when you guys post your drawing, post it to uh, my website and to... Uh, or post it to my Facebook and my um, Instagram page, and we'll take them and we'll also uh, get them sent out to all. We treat them and we, you know, social media platform get them out to all of our creative tribe. I love putting them out, putting them together. Now, uh, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Patricia, for for doing all this uh, the work to put this together. Um, are you ready for me to give my wise thirty second closing? Yeah, we're ready. Oh, bring it. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to challenge you parents and you kids to draw 30 minutes a day for this summer, okay? The, it's, it's amazing the profound impact it's going to have on your day, your attitude, your emotional well-being, and your mental well-being, your thinking. Plus, it's really fun. It's going to bring a lot more joy to your summer, especially during this time when we're all kind of stressed and a lot of anxiety. Draw it no matter what. Drawing has always helped me feel calmer and happier, all right? Now, to help you draw... Uh, if you could switch to my camera here, my drawing camera for the for my clothes. Yep, give me um, just a second the, to get back organized. Right. Oh, yeah, you're doing a good job switching, Patricia. <laughs> it's a brand. You guys are wearing so many hats there. I sure appreciate it. So do you let me know when I when my uh, 
my drawing camera's on yeah. and she's clicking. Yeah, I'm trying. So, it's it's uh, freezing up on me. Oh, well, that's all right. I'll just hold it up here. I, there's three ways I want to encourage you guys to draw with me. One, of course, uh, my book, You Can Draw in 30 Days. Oh, there it is. There it's, it is. It's, I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I got it. It's, it's a wonderful book. Of course, I'm going to say it's a wonderful book because I wrote it. But of over a million people around the planet have the book, and it's just it's it's a wonderful way to learn how to draw. It's my favorite book so far out of my twenty. Also, I want to invite you families if you enjoy drawing with me today, if you've come to some of my hour of pencil power weekly at noon webcast. That was my COVID response with creativity for the quarantine. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Mm. Um, the hour of pencil power. Well, I'm gonna I'm. Those end in a week, and on June 1st, I'm starting 10 weeks of summer art camps for you families. It's going to be so awesome, and I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I can talk uh, Jack Moore into being a featured guest artist <laughs> one week, and Ed Heck, a featured guest artist one week, and, and I know for sure I have Joel Gorey Zebtron teaching drama during our, our virtual fine arts camp, so there it is right there. Now, I have time zones for Dubai, for India, for Western Europe, for Eastern Europe, for all over America. So check it out. And, of course, uh, my Draw 3D family membership has 500 wonderful drawing lessons. After this closing animation, you're going to see a very generous discount code for all of your participants of our uh, Saturday Hour Pencil Power special. Well, if you want to I'll wave goodbye. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And have a great week. Keep drawing. I hope I see you next Saturday at noon for another episode, <laughs> episode four of NASA Artemis Moon Mission and Beyond. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. Closing slate. We'll leave that up for a few moments. Or do I wait? Just wait. Wait okay. till it comes up on the feed. And just give it a five count before you close it out. Okay. All right. Go ahead and end stream. Mm -hmm. And...